Welcome to the Creative Play and Podcast Network. Join us as we share our favorite RPGs, one-shot games, tabletop games, reviews of items, and convention panels, and other exciting things that we run into from time to time. Sit back and enjoy the show. Hi, this is Kelly, a.k.a. Trixie from Ragnarok and Roll, a sign to Ragnarok story, and Tilda Wimblewick from D&D Journey of the Fifth Edition. First off, I would just like to say thank you to everyone for listening to our varied adventures, as well as for rating us on iTunes and RPGpodcast.com. If you haven't rated us yet, we would greatly appreciate it if you could. And if you're looking for more ways to support our efforts, we are now on Patreon, a great site where you can help us continue making more podcasts, as well as some special surprises for our patrons. If you can, please look us up at www.patreon.com slash cppn. Every little bit helps. And again, thank you for listening. So I guess we're going to get started. Um, we might have another panelist. We might not. I have no idea. So we'll join us. We'll see. Great. Um, so I'm James Sabata. I'm very prepared. As you see, I brought my books and my name thing. Um, <laughs> the virtual. <laughs> that's positive. But I'm staying positive about it. You know, that's what matters. So... Um, so again, I'm James Sabata. I'm a horror author, screenwriter. Uh, I have a podcast that we, we basically analyze horror films as social commentary, uh, how films in the genre reflect societal concerns at the time that they're made, as well as today. Um, outside of that, I'm just insane, and I'm here. So that's the plus, and that's positive. So... You're well qualified. Um, <laughs> And I am Melanie Lennart. Um, I've been, uh, you know, I'm kind of not, I haven't written many books. I've written a couple of books on climate change. One of them was really more of a compilation of essays, and the other one was a very, you know, nonfiction book. And only, it, it's only um, in the last few years I've been really getting into writing fiction and just enjoying it. And I've been coming here since about 2015 and just, you know, I actually realized the other day, I thought I was going to make a switch, but I realized I'm still going to be doing both fiction and nonfiction, but, you know, this is a lot more fun. I mean, I admit. And, uh, but, you know, definitely I, I was attracted to this panel because, you know, it's definitely a struggle. And a struggle that I've gone through in both genres, you know, just trying to get something. I have finished a novel uh, in, uh, in you know, sci fi, basically. Okay. Or, I don't know, you know, people are saying maybe it's speculative fiction because it's not, it's still on Earth, but it's okay. in the future, you know. But anyway. Cool. Um, so, one caveat before I begin um, a lot of what I have to say about how I stay positive during this is is like it's privilege like i got to work from home so i suddenly gained two and a half hours a day you know or like i got a lot more time with my six-year-old or things like that um so if it doesn't apply to you i'm sorry that 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 it might not always line up with your life as well uh, I don't mean any disrespect to anybody that's an essential worker or anything else like that. When I say these are the positives, I mean, for me personally, this is what has happened. Outside of that, I've spent 20 years working in behavioral health. And I am very, well, I suffer from depression and anxiety and a multitude of other things myself. Um, so that'll probably come in here as well, because some of my positivity is actually from the negativity I experienced as well because I've learned a lot about myself. I've learned how to cope with some things in different ways, things like that. So mine might be a little weird. I don't know, but <laughs> we'll find out. Um, yeah. Uh, do you want to start? Or do you yeah, I could, I'll start with something is uh, because I think some of you could probably relate to this. So, you know, I actually, I, when I wrote my... Uh, major nonfiction book. I had been really, really, uh, I had the idea early on, you know, in like probably 1989. I was like, oh, I want to do, I want to do climate change from a Gaian perspective, like the earth as a living system and how, and I know that, you know, climate has been different in the past, so I want to explore that. So I had that idea, but didn't really have a way to do it. And then I started working as I was an environmental reporter at the San Juan Star in Puerto Rico. Uh, it's earlier 
uh, transition and very busy, very distracted. And then our newspaper got sold. And, you know, at first it seemed okay, and then it didn't seem okay. And I was like, yeah, maybe this is a good time to go back to grad school, right? So I just thought I'll go work, get more details on my book. So I was real excited about that. Spent seven years getting a PhD because, you know, uh, I thought I needed that. And then finally, you know, then I was actually ended up working for the climate assessment for the Southwest for a while. So you see how this, you know, all like spun out of control and I ended up doing all this other stuff, which wasn't bad. It certainly helped get my perspective. But as we all know, as writers, you know, if you're not doing it, it's just something life. So, so anyway, finally I did get a book contract. I was working, partly I think my work with Cleanness was helping, but so I get this book contract finally and I, okay, I got a year to write my book. And I started getting all depressed. I'm like, oh my God, this is too much, you know. And, and so finally after a couple of weeks of freaking out, I realized, look, this is the goal you've been going for, for, you know, 10, 15 years now. And, and you're finally getting there, and now you're going to be depressed. Something's wrong with this picture, and you have to figure out how to do it. So what I did then was um, started doing uh, yoga regularly, yoga and meditation. I, I had had to really do that. And, um, you know, I also found, well, I, I personally found, and I'm curious, you know, I hope this can be very interactive. Yes, please. Yeah. But I, I personally found I had to write a lot about, I had to go back and deal with my ghosts and my like family problems and stuff. I was, it was frustrating to have to spend so much time on that, but it just, I found I couldn't really move forward so much. So, um, so those were some of the things that really helped me get through and I did get it done and, you know, and actually enjoyed the process. Like, um, I'm sorry, I forgot your name. James. James. You know, I was lucky in that I had just decided I'm taking this year off to write it because of all this. And I could see how easily I get, you know, oh, I have to do this talk for a climate group. I could put all my time on that. Or, you know, so um, so I did take that time. And that's why I had the time and space to be in my head to write the book and many other things, too. But, you know, it just, I, I think some of it, I, so I couldn't, couldn't really, I, I'd have to recommend that kind of thing, just to, you know, yoga and meditation has been essential to me. I mean, I'm curious how, how other people get through. You know, is that something a lot of other people are doing too? Or I haven't gone that route, but one of the things that I found helpful was when I, I ran into uh, issues where I was very, very frustrated and basically depressed about how my third novel was going, was to just take some time to sit down and write about what was, what were my concerns, what were my problems, and what kinds of things could I use to kind of step through getting past that, to, to have, give myself a, 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 an understanding of what was, was driving the issue and then what I could do to, to move myself forward through it. I think that is so key. When these things are all just sitting there and you're just like, Oh, something's wrong, but I don't know what. It just feels uh, overwhelming. You know, I I like that you said write it down because mm -hmm. you get told that a lot. But how you follow it up with like how to move through it? You don't get told to do that. You just get told to write it down. And you're like, now what? Now so you're I'm really glad you follow through with like how can we take steps to get through this obstacle? Yeah, yeah. just the nature of my my personality. Mm -hmm. that that's that's what I would approach. People, people don't always know that that's obvious. Mm -hmm. So the fact that it was said, I think it was very helpful. It was some game planning it out. Right. Yeah, and, and even if those steps don't turn out to be the right ones, or even ones you, you actually use, just having the feeling that you have an approach, that you have a plan, is, is a way to start the process. And then if it changes, just like uh, the, the book, you know, the, the novel changed fairly significantly in some, some ways. That's okay. That's part of that process, too. Yeah. I'm so sorry. Can you repeat 
the what you did in terms of steps when it came to writing again please sure um well at the time you know and i still do a lot of i, I don't do as much yoga as i was doing then i will say i i and this actually here's something i'll share if anybody's interested in trying that i connected with the, group, the yoga connection here in town and they let me, yeah, I was very broke because, like I said, I had taken this time to write, right? So they let me do an exchange. So I was able to, you know, I'd work, I forget how many hours there, maybe six or something a week, and then I'd get to take some classes. So that really got me through. And meditation, actually now what I've been doing more is walking, you know? So maybe that's more accessible. And I, I actually find I only do probably about... 20 minutes of yoga, maybe maybe I'll do like 30 minutes or so of meditation a day or sometimes longer. Uh, but, you know, that's tempting to just get stuck in that because it's just, oh, you're sitting there and just like, ah, oh, so woke, I'm feeling good, you know. And, um, and the other thing was journaling. Just, I oh, you know what I would highly recommend is uh, Julia Cameron's book, The Artist Way. Or the, she's got a lot of iterations of this, but basically one of the things it boils down to is she recommends these morning pages, she calls them, where you just sit down and write three pages of just whatever comes to your head. And a lot of times it's like, what's the problem here? You know, I find myself on some days that I'm feeling anxious and I'm writing it. It almost turns into a to-do list, you know? But it's like this way it gets it out of the top of your head where it's sitting there preventing your story from getting through and now you can look at it kind of like what Ross was saying. Or Russ, Ross, Ross. Yeah. So, you know, just where you can now look at it and go, oh, yeah, that is an issue. And I will find that sometimes, you know, things uh, will resolve themselves. I'll see ways they can resolve. And, oh, wait, I can do this, you know. So those those have all become uh, really important. Now, I'm trying to walk, partly for health, but it just really helps my mental health so much. And I have found that... There was actually a time when I was, I was living in China for about a year on a science research project, but I was like the only person who spoke English for miles around except for the one colleague I worked with, and I was getting very isolated and starting to get really depressed. And uh, and then, I mean, you know, from a, a situational depression kind of thing. And then I realized, oh, I can start. There was actually a nearby mountain that went up to a monastery, you know? So I realized, I'm going to start doing that. So I started walking up the mountain and got, you know, except first I didn't go all the way up, then I started going up a lot. And it just made a huge difference. I don't know, for some reason, walking is amazing. So I know a lot of writers that I read about writing, you know, the, in fact, Julia Cameron is another one. She's the one who had talked about the morning pages, but she also talks about um, just walking, you know. Now I'm trying to get in. 10,000 steps a day, they say, for your health because they got some cholesterol issues. And that takes me two hours. I'm like, boy, how do people have time to do this if it's not part of your job, you know? So, I mean, luckily I've got an easier lifestyle than I've had for the most of the last, you know, 40 years. I think the morning page just really plays into something that's been big for me. Um, I've been writing most of my life, but I never really had a set schedule. And I've always been more of a night owl. So it became, when does everyone else go to bed so that I can write? And during the pandemic, at some point I went, why don't I just write in the morning and then I'm done? And then I don't worry about it all day long going, I have to get these pages done. I have to do this. And these things happen. And then I'm like, I'm not going to get to write tonight. And when I started writing first thing in the morning, I literally, like, I don't even go see my wife and child in the morning. I start writing. Like, as soon as I'm up, that, that's where I go. And it's just become, like, like it's been so helpful because once you're used to, I'm going to sit down. My goal is 300 words. Okay. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you know this, but it's really easy to write 300 words. And what happens with 300 words is I have never only written 300 words. I've written, my lowest, I think, was like 470, which is still way more than 300. And it automatically feels like this huge success every single day. I knocked off this thing I have to do, and I did more than I set out to do. And that shift right there changed my life, really. Like, it's, I've been right, just cranking out way more. Yes? Um, as a changed night owl, how do you switch your brain to function 
right when you woke up. Oh, right. <laughs> that is really easy. So what I did is my wife and I had a child, and the child didn't care when I want to be awake. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, my honest answer to you is I don't I don't know. Like I I'm still up till like till two in the morning, you know, but like I'm getting up at like seven. There's days I go to bed at ten, you know, like that part shifts now, but I'm always up at the same time. So kind and of so, practice? Yeah, basically I think I just reset myself by forcing myself because it doesn't matter when I wake up. If I woke up at one in the afternoon, I still have to go right first. So like that's, I think that's the key. It's telling my brain, you're awake, you have to get this done. So I don't think it even matters if you're a night owl. If you're waking up at noon, if you did that, I think you would progressively start getting up a little earlier. I, I don't know for sure. That's what happened to me. Um, Which but is yeah. what I asked. <laughs> yeah. And, 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 but that's the thing. Like I'm writing way more now. I'm accomplishing more. And the weirdest part that happened is I suddenly have way more time to read, I edit other authors' stuff, and I script doctor, and I suddenly have way more time for that. And yes, part of it is I no longer have this huge commute. But a lot of it is also, I don't have this cloud hanging over me that I have to do this at some point. How long have you been practicing this? About a year. Yes. Uh, I'm not a writer. Uh, I suck at writing, actually. We all but- I, I also That's why we have editors. Yeah, I also struggle with ADHD a lot, so mm-hmm. I've been told to start writing. I don't know how to start writing. Like, I don't know what I'm supposed to write about when it comes to my emotions or anything, because there's just so much right there. So I have no idea what the first word would be. Do you have any, like, advice? The, the first thing I want to ask you is, what are you doing at 7 o'clock? Because I have this panel called Terrible Things. Oh, we'll be there. <laughs> <laughs> and we're going to talk about that a lot. <laughs> um, but the short answer for everyone who's not coming to that panel is you have to write crap to write good stuff. Mm-hmm. It's just that simple. It's like anything. Nobody was born a brain surgeon. They, they had to fuck it up to get there. I think it's like when you go to the supermarket and it's like 50 billion jellies, (laughs) and you're like, I don't know which jelly to pick. There's 50 billion. I think that's how it feels. The analysis paralysis. You know, I'd like to share something from Julia Cameron's book that helps me too, is what she would start with. She would just say, look around and write where you're at. Like you're, oh, here I am at a writer's conference and they're blathering on and I just, you know, I'm hungry right now, but, you know, I'm trying to pay attention. Oh, they did say something interesting here, or you know, this makes me think of what that did. You know, I just I, I think she often sets an atmosphere of just like, oh, I'm you know, looking out at the mountains and the clouds, and That's that can be a nice way to start, yeah. Or and props can be another one if you're trying to write fiction. I, my friend and I just uh, last week we did this, uh, we did some prompts, just like 15 minute bursts of writing. We decided we're gonna do and. Um, you know, we did three of them, and like James said, you know, two of them were kind of crap, but one of them would kind of just turned out like, oh, you know, we just, it, it happened to be a prompt that worked, and it just blended, and, you know, it's like, hey, this isn't bad, you know, for, I don't know, flash fiction. I never thought, I, I just, that wasn't a goal of mine to write flash fiction, but I'm like, oh, maybe I could submit this. Picking up on, on what you said at the beginning there, there was a writer who was a presenter here in the Pima Writers Conference, was happening at it. Pima Community College West. Oh, I would, loved that conference. Yes, that was a terrific conference. Um, he was talking about, you know, how do you overcome writer's block? And it was a very similar technique. You just start writing about what's around you yes. with, with no concept, no concerns about the quality or whether you're going to use it for anything. I am sitting in my room. The walls are light brown. There, the curtains are open. And what that would do is it would slowly unlock whatever it was you were trying to get to and without you even realizing it now you're starting to write about whatever it is you want to write about you know linda addison our poet laureate here she was saying i remember this was last year i think but she was saying how she uh, will just all her stuff tends to come from journals she'll just write in her journals and i think it's really important that we we expect that no one's going to see our journal but us, you know. So that's part of the key to writing too, is to feel like no one's going to see this unless I decide to show it to them. 
then you can. Th I think that's where a lot of writers' block comes from, is when you think someone's looking over your shoulder. Yeah. It's just for you. Who cares? You already know what you're well, thinking, right? And <laughs> on that note, I think one of the th I know this is turning into a writing panel instead, but um, <laughs> what I what I think is really important to remember is when you grab a book and you're like, oh man, I can never write like Stephen Graham Jones, right? Like, oh, he's so amazing. Stephen Graham Jones hates his first drafts. He just does. And then his editor hits it and sends it back. And then Stephen has to rewrite it. And then his editor hits it and sends it back. And the shit that you're holding in your hand, A, still not perfect. You will find typos. You will find things that are wrong. And I guarantee you that Stephen King or whoever you look up to looks back at books and goes, why the hell did I do that? <laughs> and when we're starting out or we're at whatever point in our career and we're comparing our first draft to a finished project, product, you're automatically setting yourself up for failure. That's a really good point. So, you want positivity? <clears throat> Your positivity is Stephen King sat where you're sitting. Stephen Graham Jones sat where you're sitting. Josh Mallerman's Bird Box was worse than whatever you're writing at one point. Ernest Hemingway said, all first drafts are shit. That's why they're first drafts. It's exactly. a bomb draft. Get it out of you so that you can clean it up. And Lamont says, uh, give yourself permission to write a shitty first draft. Yeah. You know, <laughs> to me, great. that's uh, uh, liberation theology for writers. Absolutely. Yeah. One other thing I'd say, if um, you might need to just get to writing. Sometimes you just need to step away, like go do the dishes or whatever you need to do. Or sometimes you need to just get out a pen and pencil and do it. Because I know, I don't even have ADHD, but I'm on the computer. I'm like, I could be doing this. Oh, Whereas yeah. if you have a pen and pencil and nothing else, it's yeah. like, well... You go. It's like that or even so. pick up your phone and dictate it that like you're driving or something and something uh, comes to you. Microsoft Word's dictate is actually pretty decent. And and I have found that I can literally just like sit back in my chair. I have a, a big mic because I have a podcast, right? So I might thing here. And I will do this and I will just randomly talk about whatever I want to write. And I'll be like, I want him to do this and I want him to do this and, and this kind of thing. And then I just piece it back together later. And that's been really helpful. And I literally started that like two weeks ago. Not and it's high. been amazing. Mm -hmm. um, but here's my two rules for writing. You ready for this? They're really easy. One, ass in the chair. <laughs> Guess what? If you're not at your desk, you're not writing. Or wherever you write. But if you're not in that spot, you're not writing. My second one, this seems overly obvious. But I bet if you ask any author here, we violate this constantly. Open the document. <laughs> I cannot tell you how many days I've been like, oh man, I'm thinking about this thing, and, and I'm on Twitter, or I'm playing Animal Crossing, or whatever, right? And guess how many pages I got done, guys? <laughs> but if I'm sitting there playing with Twitter or whatever, and the document is open, I go in and I make notes. Is it done? No. But you know what? I don't forget it. So those are my two. Yep. Thinking about Be in the spot and have the document open. Thinking about writing is not writing. Yep. But sometimes yeah. you have to think about writing before you can write. Sometimes. I plot everything in my head. I write in my head for years before I crank it out on the page. So, yeah. I tend to write, I'm more of a pantser where I just start. I, You know what I, well, I'll tell you, writing... The novel that I've got now, I was writing it for years in little bits and pieces, and then I, I think it, I think it was the pandemic, you know, when things slowed down like that. And I had read Stephen King's on writing. He recommends a thousand words at a minimum a day. You know, that's just his recommendation. Uh, yeah, that's, I like your I like your idea though. Um, Plus 300, you can yell, are you not entertained every single time? <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, you know, he, he actually usually does 2,000 words a day, which to me, mm -hmm. the concept that Stephen King is doing his output on 2,000 words a day kind of blew my mind and made the 1,000 words a day seem like, okay. And now, you know, I have been a journalist for many years, so that actually, it's harder for me to write short than long, to be honest. <laughs> but not because not of journalism, but that's just how I am. But... You know, so I, I actually started doing that. I, I started doing that a thousand words a day, and I started really cranking through the novel. And honestly, that's when it started getting better. And that's when, and then I just, then I'm always coming across later in the day. 
You know, I, I mean, I, I haven't always been doing it in the morning, but I think that is a good idea because it does weigh on you. I When I was doing it in the morning, I think it worked the best. And so, you know. I was compared to exercise, and as you can see, <laughs> well, um, it is the challenge because you can't do. I've got dogs to yep. walk, meditation and yoga, and writing all competing for that one hour of good weather in the summer, right? <laughs> but no, like, I view it the same way because when I do do better with exercise and stuff, if I do it first thing in the morning, the rest of the day, I go, Well, I worked out for an hour this morning. I can't do that. <laughs> and, and this works the same way for me. It's, but, but it's not that same kind of thing. But what happens with my 300 is if I don't do it in the morning because something comes up, all day long I can be like, you didn't write 300 words? Come on, man. That's so easy. That's a paragraph if you want, you know? like, And, and that little bit has really, really helped me as well. Um, so to get back to positivity, what this all has done is I automatically start my day with a success if I do these 300 words. And that will build the rest of your day. If you do this one success, you start, you just, you have a different mindset. Like the things that normally annoy me and piss me off or whatever else, I'm automatically in a slightly better mood. I'm not saying everything's rosy, but I don't wake up like, where's my Red Bull? You're all going to die. You know, it's <laughs> like, <laughs> but it just, it just makes this little tweak in my day that's added so much positive. Uh, one of the things I really wanted to talk about also is my podcast. That's not just to make you go download it, although you should. Um, so we have the Necronama.com, and we, like I said, we talk social commentary and horror. When the pandemic hit, I was suddenly able to talk to all these authors, directors, writers that I didn't have access to before because they were all at home going, what do I do? And the two things that did. Number one, we have a way better show because I learned so much from every one of these conversations. And I also learned that, I don't know, say Brea Grant has the same problems I have with writing, right? Or uh, Alan Baxter, who I consider an amazing author, he's like, he's telling me like, oh yeah, I stared at a blank screen for 35 minutes. And I was like, oh, oh my gosh, you know? <laughs> uh, right? But, uh, <laughs> No, it, it really humanized that part of writing, but the added effect is the overall pandemic had an amazing effect on me because I have suffered with depression and anxiety and social issues and whatever else. I can be the most on person in the world in here, and I can walk out of here going, every fucking person hated that panel. You're a piece of shit, you know? And, and the pandemic gave everyone else these feelings that they didn't understand. They were suddenly alone, and they were suddenly isolated. And I'm not saying this in a vindictive, ha, 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 you have to feel it, because I don't want anyone to feel it. But it leveled everything. And suddenly people understood. And suddenly people went, holy shit, you live with that all the time? And like I said, that sounds negative, but what a huge release that was for me. I'm not alone. I'm physically in this room alone, but Brian back there feels it, or whoever. I can pick on Brian because I do all the time. But, uh, you know, like, I was suddenly able to see my friends who, in my head, their lives are perfect, which, of course, they're not, right? But I was finally able to see how it's affecting them, and I got to see this isn't just me, and I'm, like, watching the news, and people are talking about things I feel all the time. And it was such a weirdly positive feeling while also, like, making me sad that everyone was feeling it, you know? But, like, there was still something so good with it, so. You know, one of the things, too, about keeping positivity, you know, I'm going to share something, and then I'd be curious from your sure. behavioral background what you're thinking, but I know, like, the, like, those voices in your head, I mean, just trying to keep them at bay, um, it, it just, you know, I, I've gotten a little, I mean, the walking really helps, I will say, but also just even if I start to hear like, oh, you know, maybe you already can't do that. I mean, you know, like I know one of the struggles I had with writing my book on climate change 
just like, oh, I mean, even though I had done all these studies right, and I did all my homework, had the PhD, but I'm still like, oh, who are you to write this? You know, it would honestly, I'd have to spend an hour or so a day just trying to get myself, you know, boost myself up just to be able to do it, you know? So now I'm a little, age is a wonderful thing in many ways where you just start to be like, ah, I don't care. <laughs> and, uh, so, or just, you know, you're just not as hard on yourself, maybe, if things go right. And um, so now that I'm getting to 60 here, I'm kind of like, well, I'm, you know, I'm, I, this, this idea, this thought starts coming in, and I'm just like, no, no, I don't, I, I'm not going to listen, and I'll just, like, try to focus on something else. So, you know, I wonder, I mean, I think that's just, I, I think that is generally a thing. Like from someone who worked in behavioral health, I wonder what your thoughts are. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's kind of all over the place. Um, yeah, I do think that there's something to be said for getting older, like, and how you you get to a point where you're like, I don't care about that. You don't like that I cut my own hair? I don't care. You know, whatever it is. Um, I, I literally had a conversation with my wife. I was like, I'm going to wear pajama pants to the panel. And she's like, no, you're not. <laughs> and, and I was like, I wear pajama pants all the time. It's like the best part of COVID is that I wore pajama pants for like two years straight. <laughs> and I'm wearing jeans, so you can tell who won. <laughs> but my point, Hold on is, <laughs> my point is, like, overall, like, you, you just start hitting these points where you care less about these things. And you question, why is this a thing? And I think that COVID actually sped that up for me. Like, why are we working in offices eight hours a day if we don't have to? There's jobs you have to. You have to be there. I'm a grant writer. I don't need to be anywhere. Uh, if anything, I'm going to do better work being alone in my house than I will if you let me hang out with my friends all day because I'm going to keep walking to their offices and I'm going to get nothing done. Yeah. So, um, but even like... Uh, so much can be done on Zoom or Skype or whatever now and these different things. And I think that that has just really made people hit this point you're talking about where we care less about these things that have always been a role and nobody knows why. And uh, I'm fascinated by that. Um, to answer what you were saying with like behavioral health and stuff, I mean, everything is so individualized that it's really hard to answer that. Um, but I feel like uh, one of the best things about behavioral health to me has been that people who are very open with their mental illness or other issues accept others who have these things. And, and like I was saying with the pandemic putting us all in this levelizing thing, I don't think it worked overall. I watched the news, all right? Um, but I, I feel like a lot of people are more open to starting to understand mental illness, and I think that's huge. So I don't know that I answered your question, but hopefully it's in there. Well, I'm just thinking that I think sometimes it, you know, maybe this doesn't work with mental illness. This, I mean, from what I understand, it, it might not work because, as people say, depression, what you've had is probably not depression, it's just something. Like, that's why I specified situational depression. I mean, it feels yeah, like sure. depression to me, mm -hmm. but you know, it's not. You know, so so I but so maybe this w wouldn't work necessarily for everyone. But just just kind of fending those those things off that are negative before they can even root it, and then we come right back to just sitting down and doing the writing, regardless. I mean, that seems to be the key to keep you moving along and. You know, just feeling good about yourself, and I like I like your idea of three hundred words. Like I did it, you know. Linda Addison talks about just all I want to do is get one word down, because if I get one word down, I'm gonna get another, and yeah. another, and another, and there it comes. Because it keeps you current in your book too. Like yes. I'm actually in a phase right now where I've been going too long between sessions working on it and it's not good and that's where I think the like I'm looking back at my first novel I'm on the second novel now it's a trilogy or more but um series anyway but I'm looking back and going like oh you can really tell the difference in the novel where I was doing it in piecemeal approach like once I started doing it every day it became much more cohesive you know and then you know you're working on something and you're also you're since you're always doing it your mind or whoever is supplying you the information 
I later that afternoon, oh, I know they could exist, you know. And so I think it, that is probably one of the best ways that those of us who insist on writing for our lifestyle, you know, keep ourselves happy. So I'm going I'm to twist this in a new direction. Um, one of the things that's been super positive to me, you're all partaking in right now. So, um, in the before times, I would do 13 to 15 cons a year. And what happens when you do 13 to 15 cons a year is you kind of go on autopilot. And when you go to a panel, you're like, did I already talk about Get Out or was that last year? And I, I felt bad at points because you're constantly all over the place. And then I felt like I wasn't giving attendees what they were coming to my for, right? And now you're all here, and everything is fresh. Everything is, oh my god, I get to do a panel, right? This translates to other parts of my life. There was a point last year, and Brian's going to be sad because he didn't get to meet it, where my friend Vince and I rented out the film bar in Phoenix. Yeah. And we got to bring ten of our friends. We only brought eight. Because we're rude like that. <laughs> and uh, I told everybody we were going to watch American Werewolf in yeah. Okay? Great film. So they all came. When they got there, I jokingly said, let's watch Killjoy. Which is a crazy clown movie. Right? And, uh, and they were all excited about it. And you know why they were excited about it? It's not that it was Killjoy. It said it was the first event that we did where we got to freaking see each other again. And we were all so damn happy to be doing something together. And this has translated multiple times again, because as you guys may know, if you pay attention, this COVID thing keeps doing this. So I've had points where I suddenly don't go anywhere. And I've had points where I can suddenly see friends. And this huge positive thing came from that where I don't take my friends for granted. And I'm so fucking excited to see them. And I'm so happy to do anything with them, right? And, uh, I mean, I, I took a bunch of people to a really crappy movie a couple of weeks ago, and we all hated it. And it just made us bond and happy that we all suffered with it together. <laughs> I won't say the name of Antlers, but I will say <laughs> Okay, so anyway, but my point is, we, we could have all watched a, a movie that we didn't like, but we got to do it together. And that's what the pandemic gave me, is it reminded me, don't take people for granted. Be happy that you get to see your mom, or be happy that you get to see... That's weird that I chose that, because I don't get along with my mom. <laughs> but, <laughs> Maybe that's why they say But my point course. is, like, it, it reinvigorated that love for these things that I was basically taking for granted, whether it's conventions, whether it's that kind of stuff. Yeah. I was and, just wondering if you guys have any thoughts yes, on this series. Please. Like, what gets you so... So, uh... Something that's always helped me stay positive because I think everybody can relate to slamming into that brick wall, you know, that you just don't see coming, and you're like, oh fuck, I don't know how to, like, it's just all I see is wall now, you know. Like um, having multiple projects at the same time, so that way when you run into one of those walls, you just pick up one of the other projects and start working on that instead, um, and just instead of being frustrated and angry that you can't get past this one piece that you know is just like, you know, the linchpin or whatever, you know. Um, like when you can pick them up and put them down, like it just makes it easier to not get stuck, you know. Because I think that's where a lot of people struggle is you get stuck and you don't know how to get unstuck. So, well, with too many projects, I get burnt out. Yes. Well, you, you know, gotta you gotta weigh it. You know. I mean, I agree. Balance. Being able to, but I, something I'm also the person helpful. that has to be like stupid, ridiculously busy all the time. So I sort of came in late, so I don't know if you covered this, but one of the first things I learned about like being a freelancer and like working at home: dress yourself. Just put on clothes because it does help. Like if you're like, oh, I'm just gonna. The morning ritual. Yeah. It's just zooms up here. Yeah. I mean, like, yeah. It has helped my mentality, and I know that there's a lot of writers who are like, oh, this writer in my PJs, and then they'll just sit there and stick around on the TV or read a book on their phone or blah, blah, blah. And then the next thing you know, you're, you know, they're whining at you about how they wasted their day. And they're like, ah. 
Um, the other thing that I, I this, this I picked up from a Marine, but like writing is, I think, one of the hardest things that you can ever commit yourself to. So like, first of all, pat on the back, people, we're amazing. <laughs> <laughs> but second of all, um, this Marine, he was like, you know, make your bed at the beginning of your day. Like, yeah. if you, it's one simple task, but if you like succeed, You've started a path of success that does like it is low stakes. Like it's just like the simplest thing you can do. And ever since then, I just made my bed every morning. I'm like, well, I accomplished something in the first 15 minutes of my day, and it just like helps build that confidence for like when you're trying to do the bigger stuff, which is the writing in my mind, just sitting down and writing. Uh, one of the things that, that I've done, you know, a lot of writers will say, oh, I I don't feel like writing today, and you know, we all have those moments. Yep. I found if I just do what you were saying, put my butt in the chair, put my fingers on the keyboard, and start, by the time I'm done, a thousand words, two thousand words, whatever, later, wow, A, I got something done, yeah, it's probably crappy, but that's fine, it's a first draft. And, and the whole attitude has changed, my whole mental attitude has changed, I'm like, okay, this is working, I'm good. I, I always compare it to taking a shower. I don't know about the rest of you, but I do this thing where for a half an hour, I'm like, I don't do that. That's too much work. And then I get in there and I'm like, I'm never coming out again. <laughs> you know? and, uh, and that's exactly how I feel about writing. If I don't do it first thing in the morning, I feel like I'm constantly going, oh no, I have to do that. But then once I'm there, I'm like, no, I, I don't want to do a Zoom meeting for work. Tell work I'm busy today. You know, like... So yeah, I, I always come back to that comparison because I think that it works for a lot of people. But yeah. what else do you guys do to stay positive, whether it's momentary or? Well, that's why we came here. <laughs> <laughs> that's a huge step. I think the physical thing is positive. There's got to be some like you know what, what thing I did. I, I actually somebody else was talking about that early in the day, but I, I oh. It was Jennifer, she was our featured author. Ashley? Was talking, Ashley? Yeah, Jennifer Ashley, she was talking about how she hit, was in so much pain because from writing so hard and working so hard on the computer. And I was kind of in that situation too because whether you're a scientist or a writer, um, you're spending a lot of time on your computer. You're an instructor also, you know, at, that, which I've done a lot of time at. You're just on your computer so much and it's just so painful. And I had gone to a, you know, this uh, kind of healer and, and this is like oh, I don't know I don't know if I can do this I might have to give this up because I don't want to live in pain you know I'm not in pain if I'm not if I'm not doing this so and um, this I don't know this might be a little too um, out there for some people but what he did tell me was he said well you know what you've got this thing going on where it's just like circulating in you and if you can get your feet in the soil it will actually really help and so I he this can't be writing outside and you know it actually I'm really kind of an outdoor person anyway I hate being inside if I could be outside when it's nice enough you know and um, and it just made a big difference and then allowed me to be a writer and, and a scientist for that matter but you know I was just like well I don't know what I'm going to do so you know just suck the physical I mean this is somebody she was talking about you know sitting is Right up there, they said it's a new smoking for something that can be so bad for your health. I mean, so just getting some kind of physical things in there and giving yourself the breaks while you're doing it. And if you can do it outside, I mean, it, we have, you know, that's a nice thing about being in Tucson is we, even though we don't have, I mean, these summers are hell as we all know, but there's always some part of the day where you can be outside. You know? And going for a walk is, a, is another piece of that. There's actual research that says green light, is a, and Jim, you've probably seen this, is good for mental health. And, and you know, if you've got trees, I live southeast of here. So my windows, I'm looking out on part of an oak forest. Nice. So, yeah, you know, it, it's just right right there. And, yeah, sitting outside, if you can do that, and writing by hand, if, if you uh, can't get the, the laptop out there for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. That going for a walk that that has been such a big help at times. Uh, about a year ago, I lost an election, and one of the things I did the, the, the afternoon after I got that news is went for a walk, and it it's that and something else just kind of settled a lot of the a lot of the emotions that I was feeling. Yeah, 
Because it is, it's interesting. It's what we are, what we really are talking about is mental health. Because you know, just to be able to have your mind clear enough to be able to do this work, you know, where you're pulling it from. I think that's something that's been very helpful to, for me is is the semen. But uh, more importantly, it's the ability to, while I'm writing, pause and go. Does this sound funny to you? Or... And then she'll read it out loud to me, and then she'll go, hold on, I need to edit this. And I'm like, okay, I'm glad I can help. <laughs> but having someone who's willing to go on that journey with you, even because, like, you know, the rough drafts are always the roughest, and you're like, please don't read this, but also I need you to read this. Right. <laughs> That's a huge level of trust, and, and the payoff to that is um, but that actually leads to another point I wanted to make, which is surround yourself with people who love what you love. I, I don't care if it's writing, I don't care what it is. Um, I mean, maybe if it's murdering people, that's going that's too far, but it's not. <laughs> you do you, that's what I'm saying. I have no um Number one, we become who we surround ourselves with. You surround yourself with people with goals, you are more likely to work on your goals. And if you surround yourself with people who like to just hang out and talk about, remember in high school when we did, no, like, that, that's what you'll be. You, pretty soon you'll be like, remember the time we sat in a bar and talked about the time that we remember in high school? <laughs> so surround yourself with people who do the things you want to do. Um, I once interviewed Todd McFarlane who's one of my favorite comic artists of all time. And Todd told me, he goes, the secret to my success is always being the weakest link because I know how damn hard I'm working. So if I'm working this damn hard and everyone around me is doing more or a better job or they're specifically good at this job, it's like we can't fail ever. And I mean, that just sticks with me. And it's not like getting somebody to do your work, but like, Brian has goals, so we hang out, we talk movies, we talk podcasts, whatever. Um, you know, I'm friends with a ton of authors, so we talk writing, or we talk how to stay positive during writing, or we talk just anything, just like how do you keep writing when you have all this other stuff going on in your life, you know? And having somebody who understands what you're going through, no matter what that thing is, is huge. So if you're not already doing it, Find somebody who loves what you love. I know my editor, I read for Native Science Report, and he was just saying, you know, he was just like, I, I didn't really, he said he wanted to write a book, and I said, so I was making a comment about it. He goes, you know what? I have never written anything that wasn't on assignment. I don't know if I could do it. So all of us, any of us who are sitting in here and have written things, not sure if it will sell or, you know, I mean, that's just a big step right there that a lot of people can't even do. So again, pat yourself on the back for that, yeah. I think another thing is, if you're serious about writing, you have to treat it like a job. Um, I don't know of any doctor that gets to go, I don't feel like doctoring. <laughs> I don't feel like being a nurse. I don't feel like being a truck driver today. I mean, you can do that, but you won't be those things for very much longer. <laughs> Writers, for some reason, think that we have this, like, free pass. <laughs> we will walk through life every day convincing everybody, this is a real job. I'm trying to make money at this. I'm trying to do this. And then as soon as we want, we're like, it's not a real thing. It's fine. <laughs> and if you want it to be a hobby, that's a great way to go about it. And if you want to be serious, put in the work. <clears throat> I don't know if any of you have seen the movie Scare Me, but uh, one of the authors just keeps yelling at the other one, do the work. <laughs> I literally printed that out and hung it up. And every day that I walk into my writing space, I see do the work. And guess what? That's the only way it gets done. Yes. So the, the previous topic that you just talked yes. about, in terms of like treating it like a job, mm -hmm. uh, what would be the advice or words that you would put together for someone who doesn't know how to do that? that none of us know how to do it. Like, <laughs> no, that sounds crazy. I'm not kidding. Ask anyone here. We don't know how to do it. How to treat it like a job? Well, not, not like how, how to treat it like a job, but how do, how do you 
Like, how do I make books? Every single time that I sit down to write a new book, I go, I don't know how to make books. Sure, I accidentally did it last time. And, and my advice to you is literally that same thing. It's that you can't figure it out until you do it. You have to jump in and figure out how to start. And maybe that's attending writing conferences or cons, or it's literally like just following writing on Twitter, like looking up different hashtags like M writing and just seeing what people are doing. And the ones who like respond to people, hit them up, ask them questions. The worst they're going to do is ignore you. But I think it also gets back to what we were saying earlier, that 300 words a day, yeah. just just you, making that rule. Yeah, you have to put in that work to get there. Well, one way that is helpful for some people, me, um, yeah. I was a ghostwriter for two years, so it was my job. Right. I had to do 50,000 words every four weeks or else I did not get paid. It's that simple. And I had to do the steps of the editing. They had their own internal editors, but they came back with notes. Like, they weren't going to fix it for me. So, I mean, like, after you do that for two years, it does feel like a job now. It's like, but not one that I hate. It's the job that I love. Right. Um, and now it's even better because I don't have to listen to them. Now you do so, your own stuff? Yeah, now you do your own stuff. But. Here's the, the one thing I really want to say. Um, there's a thing that I had to preach constantly when I worked at a rehab, and what we would tell people is the things that you hear all the time become reality. So if you're in a domestic violence situation, you keep hearing what a piece of crap you are and how you're worthless, and you'll never find somebody better than me. When you hear it all the time, it becomes reality, right? The exact opposite is the same. And the number one person who needs to say it to you is you. So go to your mirror, and I don't care how uncomfortable you feel, say, I can do this. And just keep lying to yourself that you can do this <laughs> until you believe it. Because when you do, it's reality. So if you walk around and you go, I'd like to write a book one day, and you keep saying that, you're always going to want to write a book one day. Yeah. And if you say to yourself, I can do this, and you start putting in the work and you start believing it, things shift. I can do this. I'm writing a book. One of my pet peeves is when I hear see people on Twitter or whatever, and their profile says "aspiring writer." Mm. Aspiring writer means if you don't have your ass in the chair and the document's not open. Outside of that, you're a writer. Maybe you're not an author. Maybe you're not. I'm not bringing in millions. I don't know about you, but maybe you're not Stephen King. Guess what? No one else is. All right, but. When you start believing that you can be whoever you're going to be, you make it a reality. Um, thank all of you for coming. Um, you're welcome. Thank you. Yeah. Like, uh, <laughs> I'm sure we could have had a conversation on our own, but I wasn't joking when I said it's a huge step to walk in here. I, I mean it. You thought, I can get something from this pain. You thought, I should leave my house and come here. You thought, whatever, you know, like all of those things are steps. And I, I just invite you to go about your life that way, everybody. Because if everywhere you go, you think you can learn, you can. Also, when you finish your goal, love yourself, treat yourself. Like, oh my God. Yes. Give yourself a high five. Be like, Celebrate. look yourself in the mirror and be like, you got this because you already did it. And Celebrate every success. Yes. yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, I, I think this, this is just even thinking yeah. about this is just helping me get back on the you know daily you know, writing, whether it's a thousand words or I, I, I like that idea too. But uh, you know, just something because I think that's just the same process to talk myself back into. All right. The so last thing I'm going to say is if you come to our seven o'clock panel, look at a different person. We're going to talk about something. Thank you for listening to the Creative Play and Podcast Network. And feel free to enjoy our other shows, such as D&D Journey of the Fifth Edition and Scion Ragnarok and Roll, a Scion hero to Ragnarok story. Thank you for listening.